I want to talk to you guys today about synastry, about relationship astrology and the value in studying relationship astrology, but also I would like to explore some of the common misconceptions about what relationship astrology can do, what it can't do, and the number one first thing that you have to do before you even study synastry is going to be the topic of this video. So I hope you stay with me. Hello, for those of you who are new here, my name is Maria De Simone. I'm a professional astrologer. You can find out more about me and my work over at insightfulastrology.com where I do personal consultations. I have an entire astrology school with a full curriculum that can take you from beginner's level to advanced and everything in between. And what inspired this video is a current class I'm teaching on relationship astrology. And so the one of the textbooks that I use for this class is Stephen Arroyo's book on relationships and life cycles. So here it is, for those of you who are interested. And this is a, I think there are so many golden nuggets in Stephen Arroyo's work. I'm a big fan. And of course, we are actually using his other book for our astrology book club. So if you haven't seen that video on the astrology book club and how to join it, please go and check it out. Search it in my YouTube uh, on my uh, channel. And of course, I so appreciate you guys taking a second to like this video, comment, share it with those who you feel will, that will get some value out of this type of astrological content. So I am going to talk to you about a concept that Stephen Arroyo puts forth in his book about relationships. And before anybody can even get to the synastry part, the part where you're doing this chart overlay, let's say, of what one person's planets, where they fall in another person's house, or the inter aspects, so somebody's sun, for example, making contact with another person's moon or Venus or Mars, etc. The, the biggest mistake that I see people make, especially because they are looking at astrology videos in a very random way and making false conclusions about astrology because of that, and, and some people are not properly studying astrology. So I have come across people who will skip the part that I'm about to talk to you about entirely, dismiss it, not even consider it, and instead they are looking straight away at the the inter aspects and what one person's planets are doing in another person's chart and making a determination from that alone whether or not they should even date, explore a relationship if it's romantic, uh, whether or not this is something that has a chance. And it is, it is a fascinating setup for failure. You are setting yourself up for failure if that's your approach to relationship astrology. Because first of all, just because you see some difficult links between you and another person, that doesn't mean you should avoid a relationship with that person. No. There are so many other things to consider. Do you guys have shared values? Do you guys have the same relationship goals? Do you guys have similar needs and habits and compatibility, mental agreement? Do you have capacity for endurance in a connection? Are you even looking at any of that? Or are you making a determination based on, oh, her Mars is squaring my moon, so I'm going to stay away. Or his Mars is square my Pluto, so this is going to be a disaster. No, please don't do that. And on the flip side of that, some people do the uh, are going to the opposite extreme where there's an assumption that, oh, just because there is this glorious sun-moon conjunction in our synastry, and we have a moon conjunct Venus, and his sun falls in my seventh house, and, and her Venus falls in my uh, fifth house, that you're meant to be, that you are destined to be together, and you're, everything's going to be perfect and gorgeous in your connection. Both situations are uh, a hard no in 
in terms of what relationship astrology is meant to help you understand in a connection. So you can have these ideal compatibility aspects with someone and end up in a completely miserable relationship with them. Or you can have some less than ideal connections with someone and find that if you give this relationship a chance, there is so much there and it could really be a beautiful connection. The first step that you have to take before you even get to studying the inter aspects is to determine an individual's capacity to relate. And I'm going to read Stephen Arroyo's checklist for you on how to do this. And I will mention, okay, so admittedly, this book was first published in 1979. So most of the references that are in this book are taking a heterosexual relationship approach. So I'm going to modify that for you. I'm going to help you understand how to modify that because it's not 1979 and your uh, your sexual orientation might be very different from heterosexual and that's okay. We can still look in your birth chart and find out your individual capacity to relate and your connections with someone in the potential compatibility. So please also know that what I'm about to talk to you about in this video isn't limited to romantic compatibility. This is in any relationship that you have, whether it is between you and a family member, you and a friend, you and a lover, you and a, uh, an actual marriage partner, whatever the relationship is. If you do not untangle a person's individual capacity to relate, the two people involved in whatever connection this is, looking at both individual capacities to relate first, then you're, it's like, uh, I don't know. It's like, you're, it's like you're jumping out of an airplane without buckling the parachute on yourself first, literally. So please know this is the single most important first step in approaching relationship astrology. And so how do you even determine that? And when we talk about the individual's capacity for relationship, I don't want you to think that that means that somebody doesn't have a capacity to relate. That would be very rare, okay? That would be extremely rare. And and this is more about how someone relates, what their tendencies are, their temperament in relating. And so you have to look at someone's birth chart to first see the temperament in relating and find out if it is compatible with the other person that you are making that chart comparison with. And if it is, you're good to go. If it's not, there's gonna be a problem no matter what, no matter how much compatibility you have. So what Stephen Arroyo says first in his book on this, there's like a little outline that he has. So number one, General study of the individual charts focusing on each person's primary needs, desires, and orientations, affinities and disaffinities, general energy attunement of each person, what vibrations and qualities, color, or tone the personal planets by sign, house, and close aspects. I'm going to do a totally separate video on his concept of affinities and disaffinities and just so you know, all of this is explored in depth in my classes. So I use my, my students' birth charts to bring the astrology to life. And I'm not using any birth charts in, in these videos. I'm just talking to you about this in general. And you can apply it to your birth charts and whoever you want to compare your relationship astrology with. So notice that he's, he's calling for a very holistic view of the horoscope right now. And when he talks about this, this general energy attunement and primary needs and desires, he's talking about things like a general balance of someone's elements and modes, 
Are they really strong in one element and mode or lacking in one element and mode or mode that may color something about the uh, individual's capacity to relate? The moon is extremely important. Anybody's, anybody's moon sign talks about what you need to feel safe, to feel nurtured. And so regardless of the type of relationship you're looking at, the moon sign is going to be critical to look at in anybody's chart to determine their capacity for relating, what they need to feel okay to even be in a relationship with someone. So elements and modes, the moon sign, looking at the chart and taking a, a, a glance at, well, what are the relating planets doing? What are the personal planets in this particular person's birth chart? How are they connecting with those outer planets? Because that is what gives you the flavor and the tone and the temperament. Any of these personal planets, the sun, the moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, these are the personal relating planets how they are connected in, a, in an individual birth chart to the outer planets or to each other. You need to take the time to fully analyze this. There could be someone who, for example, has this capacity to relate that demonstrates a great need for clinginess and cohesiveness and, and family comforts and maybe that's symbolized by strong Cancerian or fourth house energy or very strong connections with their moon sign. And that is very much how they relate, how they operate. You could have another person's chart where there is an extraordinary amount of mutable energy and maybe a lot of aspects between the personal planets and let's say the planet Uranus. Well, well, that person would have a capacity to relate that's very different from the first person because that second person would be more changeable in their nature in, in relating, first of all, and also may have a greater degree of a need for freedom and separateness than that first person. So when you take those two particular people together, you didn't even analyze, oh, well, his, there's one person's sun is conjunct another moon or, or somebody's Venus is trying their Mars. That doesn't even matter. If it is, you're actually not, you're still not going to be inherently compatible with each other because you're looking at two very different capacities to relate. So I hope this is making sense. Number two, Stephen says to look at the capacity for close relationship as indicated in each individual chart, the seventh house aspects, aspects to the sun, especially for women and the moon, especially for men, the sign and aspects of Venus, what each person looks for in a close relationship, because that's what Venus is, and um, friendship, marriage, love, etc. Now I'm going to amend this part because again, this book was written in 1979 and in a heterosexual relationship checklist, it is true that for a heterosexual woman, you can look at the sun sign and glean a lot of information about uh, the capacity for closeness and, and what she desires by looking at the sun sign. And for a heterosexual male, you can look at the moon sign to talk about what he needs and, and craves in a woman. That's true, and that is still valid. But what I would suggest is that when you get to this part, instead of hyper-focusing on, yes, the sun is men and moon is women, don't worry about that. I want you to instead remember that the sun sign in anybody's chart is connected to our life pur purpose and what we're learning to become, qualities we're learning to develop in this lifetime. And the moon is anybody's needs and what you crave and what you must have honored to feel safe. And Venus is anyone's astrological love language, how you give love, how you receive love, how you want to be seen as valued, how you want to give value to another person in a relationship, regardless of the relationship, regardless of the sexual orientation. 
Okay, so just reframe this a little bit, but please see that there is tremendous value in doing this. And if it's a romantic relationship, that seventh house is gold because the sign on the seventh house, planets in the seventh house, will talk about what a person is um, is looking for in a relationship and the capacity for close relationship versus more of a separate type of relationship preference. So you really do want to analyze that. And then he talks about C, emotional and sexual needs and orientations. And looking at Mars, Venus, and the moon, their sign and aspects, examine the overall elemental balance of chart to see where the person is coming from. So an example of this would be looking at two people's Mars signs. Mars is how you go after what you want. It talks so much about your sexual needs and desires. And if you're looking at two people who are in a romantic relationship and one person has Mars in Sagittarius, let's say, and the other person has Mars in Cancer, you're going to notice that in terms of their individual capacity for relating, the person with Mars in Sagittarius has a different vibe altogether connected to going after what he or she wants and desires and expressing the sexual nature as compared to that person who has Mars in Cancer. And no, none of this is right or wrong, good or bad. This is your individual capacity to relate. This is how you operate. So understanding that you're dealing with one person that operates in a Mars and Sagittarius way and another person who operates in a Mars and Cancer way, it's going to set up some pretty important insights. Because then when you get to the step of relationship astrology and inter aspects, you will see that that Mars and Cancer person, if the Mars and Sagittarius person doesn't have any personal planets that can connect to the Mars and Cancer in some way, there's going to be a split and, and an inability to kind of find common ground in their capacities to relate to each other, potentially, okay? So then he says to study all the relevant houses, especially the 7th, the 5th, the 11th, 8th, 1st, and that house which corresponds to the person's sun sign. So this is important information to, to look at in the individual chart. Let's say a person, one person has the sun in the 7th house. Their capacity to relate is extraordinary because that's how they identify themselves. They create, they form their identity based on those connections to other people. Whereas you may have another person who has the sun sign in the first house. I'm simplifying this. And that person is very self-oriented. And maybe maybe most of the chart, so one person might have most of the planets on, on the uh, side of the chart that's closer to the ascendant. Most and the another person has planets on the other side, closer to the descendant. Those people, one of them is going to be totally self-directed and self-oriented, and the other person is going to be totally other person oriented. That is, those are very different capacities to relate. So one person relates to others through um, how other people can help them express their identity and, and fuel their self-motivated goals, whereas the other person would identify more and in a relationship way as I discover myself through you and your needs and wants and what you desire. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Now he also talks about examining all close transits and progressions that might relate to important developments, new awareness of personal needs, or new types of self-expression. So this is an interesting step because this talks about our evolution as human beings. So you're born with, with one birth chart that's active for your entire life, and that birth chart is triggered at various points in our life. It's woken up. Certain aspects are woken up by the transits, by progressed cycles. So an example of this is, let's say uh, one person has Pluto conjunct Venus in the birth chart, in their birth chart. And another person has Venus conjunct Uranus in the birth chart. 
Okay. Well, what if that Pluto Venus person is having a transit of Pluto making a trine to their natal Venus Pluto cycle in their birth chart? Well, that's going to wake up a big awareness about their intense desire for love. And the other person who has a Venus Uranus conjunction in their chart, maybe transiting Uranus is squaring their natal Venus Uranus conjunction. So think of, conceptualize this with me. You have one person who has a Venus Pluto conjunction and now transiting Pluto is trining it. That person is ready for an intense life altering relationship and connection, a deep all or nothing connection that could be very favorable. But the other person has a Venus Uranus conjunction and Uranus is squaring it by transit. That person is being triggered and woken up and stimulated for freedom and to not want cohesiveness and to want experimentation and to have some more individual expressions about love and relationship and values. So those two people with their individual capacities to relate are being simulated by very different transits when those two people meet what is the likelihood that that relationship will succeed at that moment in time it might not be very high it might it it might cause a great deal of frustration and disappointment to the pluto venus person and the venus uranus person might look at the pluto venus person and it doesn't matter how compatible they are the venus uranus person is probably going to run for the hills because they're going to get that vibe of, hey, this person wants intensity and I can't breathe right now if I deal with that. Okay, hope so something else to look, look for. And finally, he talks about noting especially any indication of shared experience. That is, inter aspects that are within two degrees of exactitude, which will be simultaneously activated by a transit. So in this case... Let's say one person has, let's say both, I'm going to just make it very simple. Let's say that both people have Venus in the same sign. Okay, so I don't know, Venus in Pisces. They both have Venus in Pisces. Well, let's say transiting Neptune is about to make a conjunction to both of their Venus signs. Okay, so their Venus signs are one person has a 27 degree Venus in Pisces, the other person has a 29 degree Venus in Pisces. So it's within that two degrees that Stephen Arroyo is discussing. Transiting Neptune is coming to make a conjunction to both of these people's Venus placements. And that means that those two people are going to have a shared experience that is of a Neptune Venus flavor for a determined amount of time. And that could be what triggers the relationship and opens up their individual capacity to relate in that Venus Pisces realm. So this is a lot to think about, guys. And I know for the beginner, it can seem very overwhelming. But again, this is the kind of material that I teach. This is the kind of material that most astrologers who have curriculums as astrology teachers or in astrology schools, they're going to go through this with you and you're going to learn how to apply this because without this number one step, I guarantee you, you are wasting your time looking at any other form of synastry and chart comparison and inter aspects. So please let me know in the comments what you think of this and how you can apply this in your own life in any relationship. I'm going to do another video, which you can search for. I'll put the link below when it's in the description box. I'm going to do another video on affinities and disaffinities to bring that concept home. And uh, thank you guys for watching. Have a great day. Bye-bye.